Welcome everyone to our second webinar of this series, talking about how we put students at the center of the learning, uh, specifically at the beginning of the year. Right now, a lot of us are wrapping up the school year, starting to take some of that summer refresh and begin to plan for the next year. And we thought it would be a great idea to bring together some folks in our ecosystem to talk about how they're putting learners at the center at the start of the year. So I am so excited to introduce our panelists today uh, to represent the school leader perspective. Um, so I am going to first introduce myself and then I will introduce each person on our panel and they'll tell you a little bit about their uh, school, their environment, et cetera. All right, so I'm Kelsey Payne. I am our VP of Community Engagement here at Learner Center Collaborative. I am originally a dance teacher, first grade teacher, uh, turned literacy specialist, uh, and now my role really is to build this learner-centered ecosystem. So it's things like this where I get to bring our community together from coast to coast to talk about problems of practice. Um, it's been a really exciting year in this role um, and I've loved doing this work. Um, Altogether, I've been with Learner Center Collaborative for about five years, and I've really loved the way that the organization continues to grow and learn. Um, and I am so excited to introduce the folks we brought here today. So the first person I'm going to introduce is Brad Droke. He's the Upper School Dean of Student Life and Experience at the Mount Vernon School in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, hi, Brad. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Kelsey. Um, so I've been, for the last five years, I was the Director of Innovation Diploma at Mount Vernon um, and I'm moving into this new upper school dean role this coming school year. Um, when it comes to learner-centered learning, Innovation Diploma at Mount Vernon, like that was our test kitchen for everything that we did. So we tested CBE, we piloted altitude learning before we launched it to the rest of our community. We did everything with a design thinking standpoint. Um, which as a school, we are deeply committed to design thinking um, and thinking about our students as the main users of, of our space. Mm -hmm. And how does that dictate everything that we do from there? Um, Mount Vernon is actually, a, it's a six week through 12th grade school. Um, so I have two little ones. I have a toddler who goes to Mount Vernon and a PK4 student who goes to Mount Vernon. And I even see, this approach to putting students at the center of everything that we do starting even at that very young age. Um, I'm happy to be here today to share more about our story at Mount Vernon and how we do this. Thank you, Brad. Um, and next I'd like to introduce Alicia Payton Miyazaki. She is the principal at Okno School in Menlo Park, California. Welcome, Alicia. Thanks so much, Kelsey. Good morning. Um, as Kelsey said, I'm the principal of Oakno Elementary in Menlo Park, California. Um, our work here is focused on being learner centered as well as focusing on meaningful work for students. Mm -hmm. So looking at real life problem solving and inquiry as it relates to being focused on learners strengths interests diverse profile and trying to get a good match between those two. Um, a couple unique things about our school is that we have developed a multi age program that runs concurrent with our traditional program and it allows us to really match the needs of a student to the learning styles that we have in the classroom. Some students thrive in the traditional program where they have a new teacher every year. Other students absolutely thrive in the multi-age program where they've got diverse learning with three different groups of kids cohorts together. Mm -hmm. um, and I look forward to sharing more about that. Thank you. Great. And um, last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Chris Bazilko. He is the head of school at Imagination School in Palo Alto, California. Welcome, Chris. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, it's so great to hear the stories of the great work everyone else is doing. Uh, I actually bumped into um, back when it was all school eons ago when a good friend of mine kind of knowing that I tend to push the edges and, and want to see what we can do to shake things up that you need to go check out this alt school thing. And so I checked out the alt school thing was able to open up a, a alt school in Palo Alto and then continue to do work with them and, and follow the great work that they're doing now as learner centered. Um, and so I ended up opening up. Uh, we're going into year five at Imagination Lab School here in Palo Alto and like everybody we have our mission and vision 
um, which I think are full of all the wonderful fluffy words that everybody uses, but we really anchor everything we do on what we call the ILS promise. And I think you'll hear that it's learner centered at the root of it. And the first is we want kids to know themselves, be comfortable in their skin, what their strengths are, what their challenges are, be able to know what tools and resources they need to be successful academically, intellectually, socially, emotionally, even physically. The next thing is we really want to make sure that every child can find and exercise their voice. Let's honor all the unique diverse voices that we have and give them an opportunity to advocate for themselves and perhaps for others. The third part is we really want kids to seek to understand multiple perspectives. There's not one way of doing anything, whether it's long division or solving for fresh water. There's multiple perspectives in the world and we want kids to actually actively seek to explore those. And last but not least, with all that good stuff, let's take some meaningful action, whether you're doing it for yourself, for your class, for your family, for the broader community. Knowledge and information isn't what school is about. School is about action. So how do we empower kids to take meaningful action? Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, let's dive in. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we're at right now in the series. Um, so right now, today on June 28th, we are providing the school leader perspective, um, and then on July 19th, we'll also have district leaders who will join us, and we will go through how to start the year with learners at the center. All right, so I introduced our panelists, and I am actually going to stop sharing my screen until the end, just so I can see you all as we dive in. For our attendees, um, I have a few questions that I'm eager to ask, but if you have something that's bubbling up for you, feel free to post it in the chat and I will be sure to work it into the conversation to make sure that all of your questions are answered. I always like to start these panels with um, defining what learner centered is to you. I think um, we all have our unique definition, just like it should be about learner centered. So I'm gonna kick it over to you, Chris. What does learner centered mean to you? I, I think it, it starts with being anchored really in child development and appreciating that there are unique differences that every child has. Um, and in this tech infused and you know, outcomes infused world, the last part is really honoring the sanctity of childhood. Like childhood is a journey, it's a truly beautiful process and we need to stop rushing kids and honor that. So learner centered for us really means having a community and a culture that shifts the power dynamic from adults to groups of children and really empowers the children to over time to own and drive their own learning in developmentally appropriate ways. Yeah, great. Um, Alicia, how would you define learner centered for you all? I, I agree with Chris. I love a lot of what he said. It really is about helping children to slow down, enjoy childhood. I think we tend to live in communities that and a time in American history that's really focused on rushing and getting faster and acquiring sort of skills, knowledge, and then also, of course, material things as well. And so taking that time to reconnect to what really is valuable, which is those connections we have with each other, especially coming out of the pandemic, where a lot of us were isolated with sort of pods that we created um, with like-minded individuals, which is great, but then we really need to expand our worldview as we come back out. So to focus on being learner-centered, we were taking a lot of our cues from students. Um, Last year, our students started independently writing letters of advocacy for things that they felt very passionate about to me, to uh, government officials and so on. And we are taking that work that they did and launching next year with a whole theme around writing as an act of courage. So taking their passion that they brought into school and then using that as a jumping off point for our theme for the following year is a really big part of our goal every year. Yeah, great, thank you for sharing and Brad. For us, um, I agree with everything that's been said, but I, I would add in empowerment. I think the Learner Center Agency is about empowering students to realize that their age doesn't equal their capability, um, which is something that I have spent a lot of time sitting with kids talking about of, um, to be truly Learner Center, I think it is that young people get to surprise people with the things that they can do um in the conversations they can handle in the maturity they can bring to different situations and it's it's actually the adult stepping out of the way um and trusting the process of education to make sure that like our students are leaning in when they need to lean in they're leaning out when they need to lean out um and that they know themselves well enough that they can actually be empowered to 
take that big step forward. And especially my context is upper school. So watching students go from ninth graders to 12th graders, like my hope is that they're activated when they're stepping out of our school to go forth and do amazing things um, while also building the like foundational skills and mindsets that, that kind of equip them to be able to do that. I think um, I love what you just said, Brad, because I love that age does not equal capacity capability. Like I'm definitely going to grab that phrase and run with it. There are so many wonderful examples right now in history of young people making these really dramatic changes. Um, a couple students just pulled, gave me a book that says that's called Old Enough to Save the Planet. And I don't know if any of you've read it, but I think that they're really wonderful. There's a couple others, but sort of in that same thing, do something for someone else, meeting young people who are doing these amazing actions as inspirational role models. And the idea of acting locally, but affecting globally is so critical. Yeah, I agree with everything that's being said. And um, I, I wanna take us to this beginning of the year um, because in some ways it gives us a little bit of that refresh uh, the ability to really set that tone of what we're expecting for our learners for the year. Um, let me just ask, like, why is it important to set the tone of learner-centered at the start of the school year? Um, I think, Alicia, I'll start with you. Sure. I think that when we start the school year and we show students that we're taking the time to get to know them as who they are, learning about their strengths, their diverse learning profile, their passions, their interests, the areas in which they want to see themselves grow, the areas in which they think they can leverage their strengths to grow in areas as well. I think taking that time with them shows them that we're intentionally planning the entire year around who they are as people. Our classroom learning communities are gonna be built around the individuals that are in the room, not designed you know, today when we don't have anyone in the classroom, right? Our teachers are not spending the year, spending the summer planning out the whole school year. They're gonna start making those plans as they get to know the individuals in the room. Yeah, yeah, at Mount Vernon, we always say that relationships are foundational to learning. And it's kind of like that week zero mentality at the beginning of the year of like, we can't just say that relationships are foundational. We have to take the time to step in. And for us, like in upper school, we're seeing kids come back. And like, what was the summer like? Like, what experiences did you have this summer that you're bringing into this year that's going to change the way you see things? Um, I just think it sets the tone. It sets, I think for me, our students can always tell when it's just like, if I'm just saying relationships are foundational learning and I'm not actually doing anything to make that, they're gonna sniff me out like that and they're gonna call me on it. Um, so we're really intentional at the start of the year um, going in. This year, we're actually in the process of our advisory moving from meeting one day a week to meeting two days a week because we got that feedback that the students were like, I wanna know my advisor more. Mm -hmm. And we're building out even a more robust approach to advisory because we're hearing that. They want a place that's theirs. They want that home community. They want a place where they can step in and be like, those are my people um, and they've got my back. But it doesn't just happen overnight. Um, and it's not a thing that you can just like leave at the bottom of a checklist that you hope you get to. Um, we've done a lot of work of like moving it to the top and that's just been a culture shift for us of, Mm -hmm. Our pre-planning schedule is split from teaching and learning, like it's like 50 for 50 percent time of like teaching and learning, competency-based, upping our assessment philosophy and sophistication, also fo focusing on SEL, getting into the trenches of like, we care about these kids and what does that look like? So where you put your time is what you value, and we're being super intentional about putting enough time to do that work. It doesn't just happen. Yeah, I would I would piggyback all of that and, and say, you know, for, we really we I think we even started putting our marketing materials like we really consider ourselves to be a relationship based community of diverse learners. So if we're going to lead with that, some of what Brad said, we, we better back it up. Um, and so we try to back it up from, from two, I guess, emergent needs, not emergent, but uh, constant needs, <laughs> certainly at the beginning of the school year. First one is from basics of group formation. You got to start norming and storming and forming. You got to start with basic group dynamics. And if you, we all remember that teacher, perhaps you walked in as a teacher and an observation or an administrator when you were a kid. And within the first week of school, maybe the first day, they're giving you the syllabus and telling you what you're reading in February. 
like creativity, voice, curiosity, just it just disappears in an instant when that happens. Um, so honoring that we need the we need the community to establish the community norms. As a head of school, I love to say on the first day, hey, you know, what's my job title? And they're, they always get conf confused between principal and head of school. And what does it mean? And blah, blah, blah. And I go, well, what do I do? Well, you're the boss. Well, really, why am I the boss? And we go through that. And I get to the point where I play a role in a group. And sometimes I have to make decisions, particularly when it comes to safety. However, I'm not the boss. We're the boss and helping them understand that very much on day one. Um, and I really think a big part of that is also because, you know, and I think I heard both Brad and Alicia say it in different ways, but really we all as learners, the young adult learners, we need to feel a sense of belonging. So we need to be feel like we're part of a community that accepts us and wants us. And we're part of a community where we can fail, where we can make mistakes and it's gonna be in a safe and nurturing environment. Uh, so I think those are all the reasons we can't expect a child to take an academic or an intellectual risk three months down the road if they're not gonna feel safe and trusted and like they belong. When especially, Chris, like that, when that path already seems predetermined for them, of like, okay, if you're telling me what book I'm going to read in February, like, is this really up to me or am I on right. this journey that you've already mapped out? So I think Absolutely. that's such an important differentiator. Absolutely. Yeah, and one thing I, I had, I'd heard a, a few examples, but um, as you're starting to think about next year, is there, um, is there something you always go to, a process, an activity, a community um, agreement, event that, that you could share with the attendees here who are like, you know, I'm bought in, I'm ready, I want to start the year um, and, and, and really put learners at the center. Is there something that you feel like could be a good first step for folks? Chris, I'll have you start. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, if... If anything, I say it makes sense to anybody, I would uh, just say it this way, go slow to go fast. So um, that's been my motto for eons now. And if you even maybe, I, don't, I know what Brad means when he's talking globally 50-50, but I'm also sure that Brad and his team and Alicia and their her team are also maybe 70 or even 90-10 in the beginning where it's focused on social, emotional, relationship building, community norming. Um, that's going to pay off in so much in dividends. Our first week, we, we do a three, four, five schedule. This year it's messed up because it's Labor Day. Uh, but we start the, the Wednesday before Labor Day, the first three days. It's a crazy schedule, which it only exists that first three days. And kids are interacting with kids from all over other multiple age groups. So we're, we're just, it's almost like an internal field trip, internal field day, but doing everything right, right around understanding ourselves, expressing ourselves, following curiosity and creativity over our themes. Um, and then we dive in and really embrace the first six weeks of school as, as a model. And that's from responsive classroom, if you aren't familiar with them. Classroom agreements, family interviews, establishing norms and routines, creating a culture of inquiry. All those things are fantastic. And I'm sure you'll hear other fantastic things. Uh, but the one, my personal favorite is along with all that, we do our first full project cycle. And that's in time for back to school night, which is in week three. Uh, and that's classroom design projects. So I give every class real money. Um, and last year it was $250 per class. And they have to solve for lighting, seating, color, texture. And this year they have to solve for plants, for respiratory fitness and health. And they then at their own levels, they go through and do some research, do some presentations. They all come up with their own ideas. It looks everything like, let's have pink pillows to we should like, you know, put a skylight in the ceiling. Um, and then we have them actually pitch their ideas and we go through middle school through eighth grade. So every group looks a little bit different, but they're all pitching their ideas to one another. I come, end up coming in and sitting down. We bring a couple of reps from the parent. I bring a board member in for the final pitches from every class. We never elect a winner. We always say, hmm, we heard some good ideas. Brad, sounds like you got something great for lighting. Alicia has some other good ideas for lighting. Why don't you all get together and figure this out? By the way, if you don't tell us what you're gonna do by the end of the day on Friday, you don't get the money. And all the kids, regardless of the age, they figure it out. And then they spend that next week putting the IKEA furniture together, painting the walls, planting the tree, whatever they do. And then they show off and are so proud on back to school night where the parents come back and the places are figuratively and literally transfixed and transformed. And that establishes a sense of belonging. 
because a child's able to say, hey, I painted that, I sanded that, I bought that, I whatever that, I voted no on that, <laughs> whatever the thing is, but they, it was a process, it's a short week process. Um, and I think any subject area, any learning goals you have, if you do a classroom design project, particularly through a design thinking lens, as Brad mentioned, you're gonna hit all your beginning of the year goals. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Chris. Um, Brad, I'm going to kick it to you next. We also have a question about the robust advisory. So I know that you, you may have an example that you want to share, but if you could also yep. share about the advisory as well. Sweet. Um, so the first thing that came to mind, and this is connected to our advisory. So something that we're launching this August um, with our freshmen is we're being really intentional with onboarding them into upper school. Um, employees are onboarded into companies. Why don't we onboard students into schools? Um, and that's how we're really starting to think about it. So we've got every day we have 35 minutes of community time at Mount Vernon in our upper school schedule. That community time, two of those days are advisory, one day is for assembly, and the other two days are for student clubs, affinity groups, and things of that nature. The first nine weeks of school for our freshmen were we are taking, we're using those advisory times and the community time to onboard them. And that is covering everything from norming groups and coming up with like a class charter of like, who will, what is this class gonna be known for? What do we wanna do? Um, down to everything of like, what's the school's reassessment policy and how do you use it? And how do I take advantage of it? Like the nuts and bolts, also the big messy, like how do you navigate high school um, and getting them to really engage with questions like that. So we've been really intentional with things that we've brainstormed. So it's, it's things around how to use altitude, what's in the student handbook. Um, the freshmen go on a retreat every year where we actually go off campus for a day um, and one night. So they're able to like go and spend time with each other. Um, that's one of our big entry points in as well as most schools have a lot of our our in new incoming ninth graders coming in with our rising eighth, gra eighth graders in the ninth grade. Um, and we wanna integrate those two groups of people pretty quickly. Um, so we are designing a really intentional freshman retreat. And then at bookends at their senior, we have a senior retreat. Um, so we kind of mirror what you do as a freshman and what you're gonna do at the senior so they can see that progression. Um, for advisory, I wish I had like this amazing advisory plan that I could share, but we're building it currently. Um, what we do know um, is that we want four different paths um, that students can go on and it will be based grade level is what we're thinking currently. Um, one of the books that we're reading right now that's in, impacting a lot of the way that we're thinking around it is Atomic Habits by James Clear mm -hmm. of like, how do we help students establish systems to solve problems? Um, and I think that's gonna be the ninth grade experience. Um, another book that's really inspiring us is um, Your Turn. Um, it's um, blanking on the author's name, but it's Your Turn, How to Be an Adult. Um, and that's gonna kind of make up our ninth grade advisory curriculum. Um, some of the feedback we've gotten from students, and again, this touches back to learner-centeredness is, Everything that we do, we go back to our students and ask for feedback on. Um, advisory, onboarding, like the things that we do, what we're hearing from our seniors is they actually wanna know like, how do I like manage having a credit card when I'm in college? Like they, there's this like list, like a punch list of things that they're like, I'm not getting this and how can we get that? So we're integrating those things in too. If you were to ask me a year from now, on June 28th of 2023, I hope that we have like this amazing first iteration of an advisory curriculum um, that we'll be redesigning because we can't stop because we keep getting that student feedback. Um, but it's in process, but I think it's, it's finding the places um, that we can connect to outside resources and outside experts to pour right back in. So it's not like, this isn't what Droke wants you to know. This is what this New York Times bestselling book is saying that like I use on my day to day. Like this is stuff that is, it's equipping them with skills that are less academic and more life ready skills. I absolutely agree with everything. I actually loved hearing about Chris's design challenge in the classrooms. I was sort of like taking notes like that's a wonderful idea. 
Um, so much is the same in terms of taking our lead from students and making sure students have multiple ways to give feedback. They're very comfortable giving feedback to their teacher. They're very comfortable giving feedback to their parents. But for myself, for our school counselor, for our, our school psychologist, we make sure that we spend a lot of time out with students as well. So they have different ways of giving us feedback. They don't have to write a letter to reach the principal. They don't have to talk to their teacher about something in the classroom. They have multiple caring adults throughout the school. And that process is also something that we really intentionally build in. We think of each student, we think of like, who are the caring adults that the student has in their life and making sure that it's really an umbrella of resources, not single path of expectation for feedback. Um, so I agree with all of those wonderful points. Yeah, one question that's bubbling up for me is um, I'm thinking about uh, Katie Martin, um, who I work with. She always says, if we want to change the way students learn, we need to change the way educators learn. And so I was thinking about the perspective that you all bring is that while you're keeping your focus on, you know, your student learners, I'm also thinking about your adult learners. So in the position you sit in now, how do you model uh, what learning should feel like, look like? for our student learners with our adult learners. Um, does anyone wanna, wanna kick that off for us? I would love to actually. Um, we've intentionally developed a program that we've renamed a number of times, but it's currently called PACT. And it stands for Peer, um, Admin, Coach, and Teacher. And so we release two teachers with a coach and an admin and the four of us kind of walk around together. And we have a very big open door policy at the school. It allows us to walk in and give feedback to other teachers. We will sometimes have a lens. So sometimes we're like, we're looking today for meaningful work or we're looking today for how teachers are giving feedback to students. And depending on the lens that we take, it gives us an opportunity to learn from each other. We send teachers to conferences and then we wanna make sure that that learning is not siloed. You know, you send someone to an amazing SEL conference at UPenn, where's the opportunity for that teacher to first share that information with everyone else, but also for other teachers to come in and watch it being modeled in the classroom. So part of our week every week is an hour that we can walk around with teachers, observing each other, giving feedback to each other, getting ideas from each other, and then it creates natural combinations. From that, someone will say, I really loved what you were doing with this oceans plastic problem you were trying to solve, and I want my second graders to join your fifth graders in working on this. And it only happens because we take the time to walk around and intentionally build that into our practice. So we have a similar program and I love that you've built it into the schedule because that's a lot of feedback we got from our faculty this year is that it, it didn't feel like it was in their rhythm of the week. Um, we call it instructional rounds. So think of it like medical rounds for anybody in medical school of going, forming small cohorts of teachers um, who are going in with in a non-evaluative way. And I think that's an incredibly important aspect of this, of spending time trying to just help each other up the resolution and fidelity of their teaching and learning practices. What's cool is kids start to ask questions when they see a group of teachers coming in. So this leads in back to the students as they see that like we're willing to learn. And it opens up cool conversations just to be able, for me to be like, well, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so came in because like I can still grow as a teacher. Like there are things that I am that I have blind spots. Um, and it shows that growth mindset to students in a way that's like, oh, they're for real. Like they mean mm -hmm. what they're saying. They're 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 asking us to do stuff that they're also doing themselves. Yeah, I love that. I think <clears throat> so much of it for us is really positioning ourselves as learners. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We we actually don't use we we call ourselves learning guides, not teachers on purpose, you don't find the word teach or teachers in our website or in any of our materials very deliberately. Um, it's just so we can sparkle those conversations. We're a little bit on the opposite end as a younger school with a small group and we're multi-age. So we do a lot of collaborative and, and peer work together, which inspires that. So right now I have the challenge of, well, how do we start using this word in a good way, institutionalizing that similar to the ways that you two are talking about. Um, so because Sometimes it'll happen every day when they're in there planning and talking, and then it'll be three weeks since they actually had a conversation, deep conversation. So we're growing to the size where I need to do a little bit more nudging, but do it in more of an institutional framework. Um, something that we haven't used yet, but we'll probably do a training next year. And uh, 
you, you're willing to bring your group, Alicia. Uh, but if you anyone's ever heard of or done or want to look into a group, look into Critical Friends Group. They do really great work um, with this peer learners, with the with our adult learners. Um, and and really, I've seen schools who actually step away from uh, too many meetings <laughs> and at least let every once every other week be just it's teacher and peer led. And so they really look at meaningful work and good good examples of assessment and, and really great frame projects. But Critical Friends Group is great. Um, and the other way I think to do it, an institutional way that we're able to do it, is we do look at things thematically across the school. So as a school of K through eight, for instance, last year we looked at migration. We were all gonna study migration. We we're gonna look at a past, present, and then a future or action lens. There were three trimesters. And we all started with Native Americans as really our entry point using them as original design thinkers. They had to solve for all these things. Um, and we all zoned in being where we lived on the Lonies to start with. The little ones kind of stayed with the Lonies and everyone changed off. So we started off with the same, even two or three essential questions across the board. And then working with the group during our summer and prep work, having our adult learners start to think about, hmm, what is the guiding question for my age population? And then you had a, they're talking to the older group to figure out like, what guiding questions are you using? And how do those interplay? So even if they're looking above their academic level or their developmental level, work in collaborating with one another. And that really helps develop this sense of we're all in this together. Because not only we are all in it behind, you know, all the social emotional stuff, which is vitally important, but to say, hey, between the academic stuff, we're also having the similar conversation. Um, and the, allowing then that the product's going to look very different because whether it's class to class or even within a particular age band, what Amy's working on is going to be very different than what Barbara's working on because their learning targets are different. And so, but we can all still be with operating within the same theme. Yeah, thank you all for sharing. Um, you know, I think any opportunity we have to model the type of learning that we're hoping to see mm -hmm. is moving the needle just a little bit more by providing choice, collaboration, relationship building, all of these things that we want for our young learners, we also want for our adult learners. So thank you for sharing those examples. Um, I wanted to move us towards some of the longer term impacts. So uh, I know I started us with like, how do we start the school year? Um, but you know, for, for all of you, you've been in this work for a few years. What are, what are some of the long-term impacts you see of setting this tone of learner-centered? Um, if you could give us an example from your students, I'd love to hear um, yeah, some of that inspiration of like what's possible when this work starts. Uh, anyone wanna start? I can. Um, so one of the, the projects like programs that we have in our upper school is something called design briefs. Um, and design briefs are external consulting like relationships with external partners, um, large business, small business, for profit, non profit, government agency, everything in between. Um, what I that's a lot of what I used in my previous role was managing those partnerships for our students. Um, so what I would always say is I have am the creative director of a consulting firm. My consultants just happen to be 16 to 18 year olds. Um, and what we would do in that is it started really small. It started with us going to a, a board member and asking for a project that he would be willing to come in and give real world feedback on the work that students were doing just to validate and justify like, we're not the only ones that are going to give you feedback. There are people in the community who can come in. Um, he happened to be a real estate developer and he asked the kids to design a park, um, a pocket park for a development he was working on. They went through the design thinking process over the course of about six to eight months um, and designed this park that is now at a, next to a Whole Foods, really close to our school. Um, and that, from that moment, while that sounds like big and scary, it like clicked for us um, to where we are now running projects like that. And it is the thing that students, when they come back doing those design briefs and we've, we've done them with everyone from like small um, businesses that our parents own where they like make pies and send them throughout the country to Delta Airlines to rethinking the boarding process. Like, you can do anything because problem solving exists in every one of those spaces. It's the same methodology. It's the same framework. It's just a different context. Um, but time and time again, our kids come back and they're like, when I get to college, which is 
the next step for so many of our students. Um, I know how to collaborate and I know how to lead a team. Um, and it's because you put me in a space where I actually could fail for someone who wasn't you. Um, so we're hearing those moments <clears throat> time and time again. And where I would encourage y'all listening to this call, it's like, you don't have to have some big deal partner straight out of the gate. You just have to have somebody who isn't you come in and give real feedback on student work. Um, it could be coming in, it could be that the, the classroom design challenge that Chris talked about. Bring in an interior designer from your community. Like it just, it changes everything. The moment that somebody that they don't know is in front of them and they have to present their ideas. Um, so lean into your parent network, like know the people and just get other people to tell kids if they're, what their work is, um, because that feedback, all of a sudden, Chris sounds amazing in his view of classroom environment, like an interior designer or architect, the kids are going to get really spooked, <laughs> um, and they're going to take that so much more seriously, um, because it feels more real. Um, there's just something about having a different audience. Um, that's the magic. And then you can scale it as far as you want to go. We've scaled it and we've had so much fun scaling it. Um, but I would have, like just find little ways to get other people in your classrooms. I think something you mentioned too, Brad, is that it's an authentic problem. It's not contrived. It's not out of a textbook. It's not, it's really a truly authentic problem. And that's what we try and look for when we're trying to solve problems is, and we try to stay a little local if we can. Um, so, you know, we've done projects about bees, we've done project our waterways, um, where we are in California have been really impacted, we have a drought, uh, trying to keep things as local as possible, that really gives students that feeling that their actions are having an immediate, it's, I don't want to say immediate gratification, but it's really immediate feedback and immediate actions that they're really feeling empowered to take. And they leverage that year after year. Our kids are much younger than yours. We have a TK through grade five. So, you know, our kids leave us when they're about 10, but they leave us having advocated at city council for a change or like, mm -hmm. you know, had a meeting with the lunch masters program because they really feel like there's far too much plastic waste in it. And there's much better ways to package it. And the lunch master people, you know, respond very well to that. And they, they were like, we will change our packaging you're very angry about this and and you're expressing yourself in such a really powerful way and you've got all these thoughtful potential solutions for us some of which are meaningful and that they can implement and they understand that like okay we're not going to be able to package everything you know reduce all packaging at all but they see that um their words and their actions their thoughts and their designs some are actually being able to be implemented and then they learn about more restrictions or more parameters or more pieces in design and they grow from that learning as well. Yeah, just short and sweet, uh, echoing everything you're saying, but going back to that reference I made of, you know, that class we've all been in where here's the syllabus for the year is so disempowering versus I created this and I did this is literally opposite and empowering. And I think Brad said it earlier, but you're not going to get there if we don't create time and space. So it's less about the perfect curricula, the perfect assessment, the perfect tool. It's more about kind of a, a tau, if you will, but the time and space for kids to have that belonging and, and, and fail forward in a supportive learning environment. Yeah, these are all really great examples. Thank you all for sharing. Um, a question that's coming up is around data. It's usually that question that you get if you're shifting a learning model or if you're making big changes in your school or in your classroom, one of those first questions is, okay, I see the qualitative data here. I see the portfolios. I see the projects. I see the learners. What about that quantitative data? Uh, I think my question is less around how do you solve for that, um, but more about like what's that conversation like with those stakeholders who are asking you about data? Um, what's your response? Um, Chris, you're off mute, so I'm going to start with you. Oops, I should have muted myself. Um, no. <laughs> um, well, I, I always smile when we get to data. I'm a big fan of the folks at DataWise. If you don't know DataWise, you should get to know DataWise. Um, you know, we get our first piece of data, and I know it's qualitative, but you can quantify it if you really wanted to. Uh, when we do morning meetings, when we go around the circle and ask kids how they're doing, uh, when a child walks in the classroom and they top they, you know, they tap the, their zones of learning model to show you what they are. Like, this is all data. We can certainly quantify it, 
So I think too often we dismiss it as qualifying it. I think um, mm -hmm. sometimes we don't need to quantify things. Um, but I think when we're probably talking about quantifying data, depending on the grade level, we're talking about dropout rates, we're talking about engagement, we're talking about grades, uh, things that we don't do at my school. <laughs> so we've gotten rid of grades, uh, but we certainly are focused on competencies and how do you report those out and how do you prepare kids. So behind the scenes, Altitude's a great tool to be able to utilize and keep those common core standards behind the desk or behind the students. And we can go through any problem-based project and really focus on holistic perspective, what are the things we're working on and capture all that data and see that, see that things are moving forward. We didn't have the challenges that we read about over the last two years of academic readiness dropping through the floor during coronavirus. That didn't happen to us. We didn't have engagement in classrooms dropping because kids were working remotely. That didn't happen to us. And was it a great, amazing team? Yep, absolutely. Was it having access to tools that we need in the moment and being, being flexible and fluid as, as core values of our community? 100%. But it was really about the fact that we are relationship-based and we opened up with the kids and we failed with the kids and talked about how can we better engage in this environment. And that kept the kids motivated and engaged. And I think that those two things, engagement and motivation, are what's going to move any data point <laughs> further than a lack of engagement and motivation. Um, so then, you know, we, we don't have to do the grades thing. We do map three times a year. Our scores are, are have continued to be positive and are compared to others. We're really happy with where we're going and what's happening. And it's great to be able to say, hey, we're going to use Common Core as a measuring tool, but we don't give grades. <laughs> So let's just check in on that three times a year and be very explicit to our stakeholders, including our parents, right? And our board that the first beginning of the year, we just want some baseline data. We take it week three without any prep. We really look at that summer slide. It's actually the only score that I send home because I look for fall to fall. I wanna share that's actually enduring learning. You can't capture enduring learning in the spring. <laughs> You're capturing prep learning. Uh, and then in the winter time, we, we tell families we're doing it, but let the families know that this is really all about instructional. We don't teach one subject at a time, one domain at a time, but it's an opportunity to see, hey, before I really dive into my formal data and measurement unit, I've been doing a little bit here and there. Let me see where the kids are. And then let me test that hypothesis versus what I'm seeing in the classroom. And then we use that as an entry point. So the data isn't the label, it's an entry point to our exploration. And last but not least, as we finish off the school year, it's an opportunity to kind of see the great. Where are we in capturing these data points for the kids? And particularly uh, for some kids who have some explicit academic learning goals, particularly a child who might be remedial in some areas or some kids who are trying to push in other areas, it's a good tool to be able to utilize and find and from that. So we've seen those data points move forward pretty strongly in close correlation. And just to go back, I'll start rambling, but so don't dismiss quality, things that we do and capture every day only as qualitative data. It can be quantified. Um, we're just putting our time in other places, I think, as educators. That's it. We're a public school, so there's all, we take all the state tests. We have to do all that quantitative data that is required by the state. And I go back to what Chris said at the very beginning, you go slow to go fast. All that relationship building absolutely impacts all of that quantitative state data. It really does. Um, if you build a firm foundation, it always has impacts on how the students do on their academic. If you're, even if you have to do, you know, state tests are very discreet in terms of their data quantifications. They wanna know if you can do, you know, area method multiplication. It's a very discreet piece of data. You will see large results in that with your focus on who the learners are, teaching them to who they are, empowering them to have voice and choice, and doing learner-centered relationships at the very beginning, it absolutely impacts the quantitative data at the end. For us, so we're interesting. We're in a, when I think about data, I think about letter grades. It's like exactly where my head goes. So we're in a hybrid environment. So we do competency-based for everything and at different points, but throughout each one of our mods, which other places would call quarters, we convert to letter grades. Um, we do a lot of the Georgia, being a school in Georgia, we have um, for scholarship requirements for the Hope Georgia Hope Scholarship, you have to have a GPA. And we can't move away from that because our families would 
would not appreciate it. Um, it is an awesome scholarship. So we have to live in both worlds. So while we're giving very rich, robust feedback through altitude, there's still this moment and it, it still feels weird for all of us who are like CBE to the core. If I could like wave a wand and grades disappeared, I would do it. Um, that we have to take all this really rich data that we've collected through altitude and put a number to it. Um, and it's just, um, our head of school always talks about the messy middle of doing work like this. And this is just like one of those messy truths of we know what is best for students. And it is assessing them with rich feedback. It is tying learning to specific measurable outcomes. And we still need to do this letter grade thing that we all know doesn't actually quantify anything um, besides just a benchmark against other people, right? Um, so we're navigating that. I think that that is the messiest part of doing this type of work. Um, I think it's, I think for me, <laughs> I'm more of a qualitative person. I love telling the stories um, and it lends, I think those are the pieces of data that I grab hold of. Um, we're also a relatively young school. So our first graduating class was in 2008 um, with this push being, um, really over the last five to seven years, we've been really pushing CBE, design thinking, inquiry-based learning. Um, the first graduating class that went all four years through Innovation Diploma, the program I mentioned earlier, actually just graduated from college this past spring. So there is about to be this push of like, what are our alumni doing? Um, from after graduating from an experience like this, okay, successful in college. We have always said we're playing a much longer game than college. I want to know what early career looks like for our graduates. And we are now capable of going back and starting to gather that data set. Because um, I want to see that like long term. Are our graduates doing things differently because they went through a learning environment that was more student centered and agency based? Um, what happened in college? Um, did that shift anything? I'm just, I'm fascinated in collecting that side of things. We just haven't been able to do it yet. I just have to share that we celebrated our 70th birthday this year. <laughs> I know you both have young schools and like we're, <laughs> we just celebrate our 70th birthday. And um, I think sometimes it's hard to see change in public schools that have been around for 70 years. I think there's sort of like a little bit of institutional history that gets woven in, but I, I think that there's so much wonderful inspiration out there and our school really has always embraced students. I mean, you look back at our yearbooks from which we have copies of from like in the 50s even and they really do embrace students for who they are even then. It's been something that's been woven into our fabric for 70 years now. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you all so much for sharing. Um, I think that having some of that language to talk about qualitative versus quantitative really allows the focus to go back to the really important learning experiences. If you are solving for how do we ensure that we're making sure like all the stakeholders here know what they need to know to um, sometimes just check that box of like, we're doing it. We're good. Um, and our, our kids are blossoming and growing. So thank you for um, thank you for confronting that challenge that I know a lot of people have around um, shifting learning experiences and data. So thank you. Um, we do have a question here around like, what does your curriculum look like in the classroom? So I was thinking about how to ask this question of, um, you know, curriculum. And so I think maybe if you could just share a little bit more just like structurally how you think about, you know, I, I heard Chris start to think about uh, thematic uh, experiences over grade levels, but if there's a, a piece of structure to your curriculum that you feel like is either unique to your school or really drives this learner-centered work, um, if you could share it um, with all of us. Anyone want to hop in? I'll give it a, a low stab, but I'll just so give Alicia more time to think because I think we have a, a bunch of public school folks on here who have deep, probably deeper, more probing questions uh, than than at least the level that I'll answer it from our community. So I think um, 
from a, a systematic standpoint, uh, I'll just go back to mathematics and kind of a foundational elementary classroom where we know we're going to count with start with counting cardinality. We're going to look at number sense, but we're going to probably start off with um, I say probably because I'm going to give my team obviously some input and we've done this in the past, but we might iterate and do something different this year. Uh, but we're probably going to start off with some type of standard unit block play. And that block play, they'll be telling stories and creating what does it look like to be in the community. So they'll be creating community in a pretty big space that they'll have to create community and then start to integrate all kinds of those little counting animals and counting families and all those little things that young elementary educators know about. And then we'll pull them aside because we know what the Common Core goals are for kindergarten through second grade. We'll pull them aside and we'll start seeing where are they and we'll start having little conversations with them. And then some kids will be writing their numbers one through 20. Some kids will be adding this and that. Some kids will be telling us what this shape and that shape is and categorizing, and organizing things. And what we start to do, same thing I did as a recovering middle school math teacher, I start to create little clusters. And I know that this is my cluster and this is my cluster and this is my cluster. It doesn't matter what their grades were or experiences were last year, it's where they are today. And I can cluster them today. And then from there, I start going, great, we're going next next year we're doing responsible production and consumption although we need a much sexier uh title for families and kids but <laughs> that's our theme right now uh, and so as we dive into that it's having me empowering and trusting the educators to be able to say i'm going to start figuring out where my kids are from a standards-based perspective in this play engagement arena storytelling arena and then i'm going to start making connections to the bigger theme from there so the first six to eight weeks of our school, our curriculum is building community. It literally is community building where the focus is on the individual and the group. So we do all those baseline assessments in the beginning of the year. And we're not just functioning on what's that first domain we're looking at in any academic category, but we're kind of doing a little fun project, not so much a problem-based piece at that point, sometimes just a project-based piece to see where kids are and their understanding holistically in this topic, subject area and then start to frame the curriculum through that lens. So it's really about having a systematic approach to figure out where they are to learning targets and being able to shape and influence those along the way. Thanks, Chris. I will say, I, I saw the previous question also, which was like, how do you, um, she gets the why, but how do you get from public school? As, as a public school, I love being a public school. I love taking all comers. I think that's one of the greatest things about public schools. We take everybody, we love everybody. Um, I'm a big believer in public school and it, we do have adopted curriculum and we do have benchmark assessments and we do have pacing guides. The secret is that they're not hard and fast. Um, we really believe in autonomy also. And I think if you want to do innovation, you have to give teachers time and you have to let them fail and you have to let them know that they're going to fail. Just like you're going to, like we model failure for our students by failing ourselves. You know, we had a multi-age that really took on a very, very ambitious project and it went left halfway through and it still produced something really amazing and some really phenomenal learning. But like they talked with the kids about how this was not our expected outcome at all. And yet when we really just kept asking ourselves questions and our, our principal gave us that latitude to not say, you told me that this was your project and this is what you were gonna do to explore and to have it be open that really allowed them to continue to work with the students, keep it learner-centered for the students and not have it be about making all these benchmarks. And we, I think, you know, if you're in a public school, you're gonna have adopted curriculum and you're gonna have benchmark assessments. I think in many public schools, you'll have all these pieces, but the results come. And if teachers know that you are looking at the long game, that it really is about going slow to go fast. And it really is about our, our T1 benchmarks might not look as strong, but our T3 benchmarks are gonna look amazing. And it comes down to modeling failure for the kids. Kids feel safe, kids take risk, kids fail, kids learn more from that process, allowing teachers autonomy to pursue their passions. You know, if we're doing persuasive writing, we don't all have to write about, for example, like in fifth grade, Lucy Calkins chocolate milk. We can pick something that we're really passionate about that comes from us or that comes from our students. And we see teachers writing about a myriad of topics from social justice to environmental action to even just the way the janitors like clean the school. We had a whole piece on cleanliness in the boys and girls bathrooms and they did research and so on. So giving them that latitude and letting them know that that is something that you absolutely support and that not everyone on the team has to be on board. One teacher can go in this direction because their learning community will look different from the learning community in the room next door. 
um, I feel like that's how we've been able to make this work really well in, in our public school. I'd just like to give a quick plug to Menlo and any public school folks here, because I started in public school as well. But I think what's interesting about Menlo as a district, and similar, I think you were saying some of the same things, Brad, that you're doing uh, within your groups. But in Menlo as a district, they are explicit and deliberate about having different models in different buildings and sometimes different models within a school so that it's not a one fit size fits all. And they're doing it with the curriculum that's coming from the state, the standards and the tests which are coming from the state, but all their schools, not all this, but you, there's a great deal of diversity, I wanna say within Menlo District when it comes to kind of the approach and the, even though the standards and the tests are all the same. Thank you. For us, I'll answer it somewhat quickly, the lever that we decided to pull in terms of curriculum of like how we could change it was our all around time. So we redesigned our school schedule um, four years ago to prioritize depth over breadth. So we have a mod schedule now. Um, we took a lot of inspiration from Colorado College's block plan um, where our kids are in a smaller number of classes. They take four academic classes at a time for nine weeks at a time. They meet every day for 65 minutes. So when it comes to terms of like Carnegie unit, they still hit it, but they do it in a semester versus a whole year. Um, so we can go a lot deeper in two mods and prioritize that level of learning over the like, well, let's make them sit in this seat for a whole year. Where that got us is we have a lot more interesting class offerings that are like nine weeks. So our course catalog reads like food chemistry or um, or for that one, we have it as molecular gastronomy or biomedical engineering or um, pirates and scallywags. Like the course catalog and the naming of things, we're big on language. Like kids are excited to take a molecular gastronomy class. They're still gonna learn chem, but like there's excitement to it. Um, it also is empowering for them that they can think about it in terms of nine week chunks of like, I'm making a nine week commitment to this class and I can try it. Um, again, we're a hybrid, so there's still APs in there too. So like an AP lit class would be two mods. You guys, like if you wanna take that, if that's the story you wanna tell to colleges, it's here to Chris's point of like, we have diverse learners. We have people that wanna top out and do APs. We have students who like, want to go full on inquiry-based, project-based. And we've designed environments that both can exist in rooms right next door to each other. Um, we've just took the time to set aside time to make it work. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all that. I this, this conversation has really filled my cup today. I am so grateful to you all for joining and sharing about your experience. Um, I know I will leave with a lot of these tidbits in my mind that I hope I can continue to share with our ecosystem and our community. So thank you so much. Um, as we close out, my final question is what's inspiring you right now? Um, is it a book, a podcast, a colleague? Um, what's one thing that is filling your cup when this work is feeling challenging? Um, because we could all use that. So, um, Brad, do you have something that's inspiring you right now? Yeah, so actually last week I had the opportunity to spend a week at the Stanley H. King Institute. Um, mm -hmm. They run an institute at the Brooks School in Massachusetts and one at a school in Colorado Springs that's all around deep listening um, and how do we sit with our students to truly understand what's going on with them. I'll say like, it was my first in-person in conference probably since 2019. So it, it filled me in that way, um, having not been able to travel to conferences um, during the pandemic, but it was such a powerful experience to sit and talk deeply about how do you connect with kids and how do you give them the space to arrive at solutions on their own? Yeah. I think so many of our kids come to us for advice because they don't want to do the hard work of figuring it out. Um, how can we sit with them and help them get to their own insights? So could not recommend that professional development more. So Stanley King Institute. Great. Thank you, Brad. And if you wouldn't mind just dropping it in the chat or I can, yep. I can get and share. Um, Alicia, what's inspiring you right now? I just say I'm almost going the other way. I feel like I've worked for two years straight without a weekend or a break or anything like that. Um, and 
I'm reaching the end of it, but I'm really intentionally recommitting to spending time out in nature and talking about things that aren't school, which is interesting because it's actually then at night, I think about all those connections to school. So taking that intentional space is actually providing me with all kinds of inspiration going into the following year. Yeah. And just a reminder to fill your own cup so you can <laughs> yeah, pour it into others and being out in nature is the perfect way to do that. Um, Chris, what's inspiring you right now? Um, I, well, this conversation, I think, you know, certainly <laughs> I've already said that, you know, the, the best master educators are actual master thieves and it's the ability to hear something that someone else is doing and then make it appropriate and work for yourself. And, um, so thank you all for sharing, including the questions from, from the audience. Um, I would say, you know, there's things, it's been really interesting as a long time progressive and constructivist educator to see that, you know, brain-based research is really proving things that have been happening for centuries now, at least validating them. Um, so under the, there's nothing new under the sun auspice is like, read Paulo Freire. If you read Pedagogy of the Area Press 15 years ago, read it again. I just started it. Last time I read it was about 30 years ago. Uh, read Elizabeth Jones, an emerging curriculum. Look at Kurt Hahn, Schools and Legacy. I mean, there's so much beautiful work about experiential education, expeditionary learning that can be and should be applied in any classroom. Um, today, uh, actually read Alfie Cohn. He's one of my favorite cognitive dissonance person, people. So like dive into Alfie Cohn and he will overfill your cup at times. <laughs> um, but then like watch films from folks like at Real Link. If you aren't familiar with Real Link, they did, um, well, they just did Chasing Childhood um, and they have a, a, a new movie coming out about math. I think it's count, Counted Out is the latest title to it, uh, but really talked about some of these big problems which are happening globally, not just here in the States, and also examples as, I, as I've inspired by today, examples of successes, examples of ways to take these big problems down and start having successes. And um, my, my last piece was just start now. You can't have the perfect plan, so just start and screw it up but make sure that you created time and space to learn with and from one another and get feedback so you can just do it again. Well, with that, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, I am going to wrap us up and just say thank you for all the attendees who came and joined us. Um, we hope that this filled your cup so that you can go on and continue to do the amazing work that you all are doing. Thank you so much to our panelists. Your insights, your perspective are so valuable to uh, our community. So thank you for taking the time. And um, I do hope that this summer you get some rejuvenation and some rest. And we will be so excited to connect with you all again in the fall. So with that, I'm going to close us out. Thank you all for, for joining. And thank you, uh, everybody. We'll, yeah, we'll talk to you all soon.